fight an endless warrior, someone with the means or the capacity to stay in the fight until the very end. Well, the simple, crudely simple, naively simple, optimistically simple answer to that question is you try to be smart and fight the war in a smart way. And I want to give here smart in three lessons. Three lessons to smart would say. So the first lesson is this. You have to build a better understanding of the fights. So in the context of copyright, Copyright is a regulation by the state intended to change what would have been the regulation provided by the market. The regulation by the market that would have created the incentives to produce too little, too few innovative works in the context of creativity. So it's an exclusive right, a monopoly right, a property right, necessary to solve what is an inevitable market failure, at least in certain fields of creativity. So in this sense, I want to call myself pro-copyright. Even in a digital age, maybe especially in a digital age, I think copyright is necessary. But in the context of this internet age, we've had a fight about copyright that's been a fight about artists' rights. So for example, in the context of music, we've seen a practice of massive, quote, sharing, which now courts around the world have deemed as illegal, and that sharing has been fought by artists, or especially the artist representatives. And we on the other side of this battle ballot, 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 ballot have been fighting and challenging them as they fought against that sharing, and they defended their right to challenge against that sharing. But if you could rise above the din of that fight, should recognize that both sides here acknowledge a fundamental fact. The copyright, in some form, is essential. For a certain creative work, copyright is essential. But copyright is relied upon not only by artists. It's relied upon as well by publishers, too. Publishers, who are a different animal a different kind of incentive. We maybe don't need to go as far as Milton, who referred to publishers as old patentees and monopolizers in the trade of book-selling men who do not labor in an honest profession. To them, learning is indebted. We don't have to condemn them quite as much to recognize that they're different in the sense that the economic problem faced by publishers is different. It's different, and so it begs this question, so who is copyright for? Well, in the Anglo-American tradition, that question was answered eventually by the Statute of Anne. The Statute of Anne in 1710 establishes a copyright regime. 1769, it was interpreted in a way that made it seem like copyright was perpetual and therefore it was effectively protecting a publisher's right. But in 1774, the House of Lords, in a case involving this work, reversed itself and held that copyright was limited, that it was intended to benefit authors and free culture in the sense of culture freed from copyright was born. Copyright was not for publishers, even if publishers benefited from it. It was a creative right, an author's right. And even if publishers benefit, we should understand copyright and interpret it as a right for authors. Now, I remark this obvious border because I think this debate forgets it. We are fighting the battle about copyright, where copyright is essential, and we pay too little attention to the battle where copyright is not essential. So here's an example, science. I opened up my Harvard Gazette uh, last year, and I found this article by this new economist, about this new economist at Harvard, Gita Gopinath. And Gita Gopinath uh, was interviewed by the Harvard Gazette about her life at Harvard and how much she liked it. And the interviewer noticed that her sh the shelves in her office were basically empty. So he asked the, uh, 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 Gita Gopinath about this, and she said, the shelves are empty since everything I need is on the internet now. Everything I need is on the internet now. So what exactly does she mean by that? For example, let's take a particular topic that you might want to research. I've been researching this question of corruption in the United States Congress recently. So let's say I go to Google Scholar, and I type in campaign finance, and I get the top 10 articles that Google Scholar reports as the most cited articles in this field. 
So let's see how I can get access to these articles. Download, I click on the first one. To read it, it cost me $29.95. Click on the second one, JSTOR controls it. I have to secure access through JSTOR for terms not specified. The third one, $29.95. The fourth one, I could read it for free, but only if I sign up for a subscription, and the subscription price will be 69 euros after that first reading. The fourth one, JSTOR once again. The fifth one, JSTOR once again, but here it tells me I can pay $10 to read this article. The sixth one, JSTOR. The seventh one, JSTOR. The eighth one, JSTOR. The ninth one, $29.95. So, how accessible is this scholarship? I get one copy for free, at least one time only. One I get to pay $10 for. Three I pay $29.95 for. And five, terms unknown. So, when Gita Gopinath says everything I need is on the internet now, what does she mean? She means if, and that's a big if, you are a tenured professor at an elite university, or maybe any professor, or maybe students and professors at an elite university, or students and professors at US universities, maybe if you're one of those, you have everything you need on the internet now, if you're one of those. If you're a member of the knowledge elite, then you have free access. But the rest of the world, not so much. Now, we should understand this as outrageous. Right here, Hillary Clinton thinks it's outrageous. <laughs> it's outrageous because we built this world. We academics built this world. The system of control or limitation flows from choices we as academics make when we choose to publish our work in a way that gives the pu publishers the right to control access to work in this way. Choices we make about copyright. But here, copyright is not being deployed to enable authors to do anything. Here, copyright is being deployed to benefit the publishers. There is not one of the authors on this list of the 10 top articles about campaign finance who gets any money from the copyright. Not one of them wants distribution limited because of this copyright. Not one of them has a business model that depends upon restricting access to their work. Not one of them should support this system as knowledge policy for the creators. It's crazy as knowledge policy for these authors. And the craziness doesn't stop here. So, my daughter was born about two and a half years ago. And uh, when she was born, our, the doctor said he was concerned that she might have jaundice, which turns out to be, I didn't recognize this, a really serious disease. So when the doctor said this, I did what every uh, obsessive academic would do. I went and I looked at all the possible articles I could about jaundice. And I kept a tab, if I had not been a member of an elite university in the United States, to get these articles about jaundice would have cost me $435. Okay. But I got it for free and I was happy. But about two and a half days after she was born, she fell into a very severe state of lethargy. And we called our doctor, and the doctor said, uh, you need to race her to the emergency room. So I bundled her up, and I got in the car at 3 in the morning. I raced to the, university, to the uh, hospital, children's hospital. And we're sitting there in the emergency room, and my daughter is basically asleep next to me. And I need to do something. So I pull out the packet of articles that I, I printed off so I could read them and learn something about this disease that um, my daughter might be afflicted with. And I take the first one, which was this one, which is published for free in the American Family Physician. And I start paging, reading the article, and I get to the chart that will tell me never, whether I really need to worry about this condition. You know, how responsive, after how many days. And I turn the page to look at this chart, and this is what I find. The rights folder did not grant rights to reproduce this item in electronic media, for the missing items, see the original print version of this publication. And I had this astonishing moment of liberation from the terror that was sitting next to me and the fear of the dog, my daughter being sick, because I could now worry about our scientific culture being sick. Because I thought, what possible reason could there be to be publishing articles in an architecture where you not only can control access to the articles, but access to the elements in the article. So we are licensing different versions depending upon whether you get the graphs or the equations or whether you get the summary tables. Regulating access to articles or to parts of articles, and not just in this case, but throughout. 
because increasingly we are building this architecture for access to knowledge through, for example, Google Books, to perfect control down to the sentence. Now again, as an architecture for knowledge access, this is insane. Architecting access here to maximize revenue, and why are we doing that? Is it revenue to the authors that we're maximizing? Is it a restriction necessary for authors to have the incentive to create? Does this restriction serve any of the limitations that we typically tolerate in the context of copyright for the purpose of copyright? The answer to those rhetorical questions is obviously no. This instead is the natural result of for-profit companies versus not-for-profit companies facilitating access to this content. And we have to recognize that these different kinds of companies serve different functions. The for-profit company's objective is to maximize profit. The not-for-profit company's objective is to provide access. And access to a good that we all must have. Every library must have access to this, at least in elite American universities. So the consequence of this business model, the for-profit business model, plus the inelasticity of this good produces the consequence that the price of journal articles relative to the inflation rate has skyrocketed, and the cost of publication for these four uh, for profit journals are uh, much, much higher than the not-for-profit journals. So this study by Bergstrom and McAfee calculates that the cost per page for a for-profit journal is four and a half times the cost per page of a not-for-profit journal, and the cost per citation is 9.2 times of the cost per citation from a not-for-profit journal. And this difference is a difference we should certainly expect so long as we encourage publication in the context where publishers are given an exclusive right to control access to this content. And I always forget to say this, but by the way, the kid was fine, she didn't have John, so everything was okay. Okay, now but the point is that a better understanding of this